the flight part three, others down below. I was much more aggressively physically when we were younger. But as the years went on, between kids, too much work and too big a belly things slacked off. By off I mean once a week instead of daily. We are back up to two or three times per week and I think the playfulness factors is creeping back in. I think number wise we are both pretty equal. Not supermodels, but not troglodytes either. We were moving couches Sunday when we found the copy of Just Friends that she lost. So, she is going to finish that and we can start talking about mutual boundaries that we can both agree on. I've read Surviving the Affair as well as several adult children of alcoholics books. I'll suggest to her that we do as needs, her needs next as a mutual read and we can discuss it as we go. It's been difficult to give her words of affirmation. Really damn tough. I've focused on the gifts, I'm pretty creative and it's easier to plan something like that out and not screw it up in the heat of the moment. For the words of affirmation, I've also put cards and notes in the gifts talking about the things I like about her. She does good with the physical touch but has been woefully absent for quality time. Backing off theater will help here. So, I am looking forward to the next couple of weeks. She is on board with everything but her covert narcissism. According to her she just needs more positive accolades and affirmations. There is nothing wrong with her. Some of the reading I've done describe a type of co-narcissism a child of a narcissist can carry into adult relationships. She shows enough empathy that I don't think she is narcissistic to the core like her dad. But it's more than the typical need, appreciation of being praised for a job well done. One of these days we'll get our finger on it and both agree, then we can cope with it better. Two months later, I've been doing a lot of reading. Took a week's vacation for myself to go off into the woods and fish. Was nice just leaving everything behind. I was worried that I'd be paranoid about leaving WW alone for the week, but I was able to keep that at bay most of the week. It crossed my mind a couple of times, wondering what she was up to. We had pretty limited communication, but she did a good job of keeping me posted about what was going on back home. I found the week away very enjoyable. I think a lot had to do with the lack of triggers. She has pulled back from theater. We have gone to a party or two together, but nothing that I'm not comfortable going to. We are seeing a new therapist tonight. Last one was pushing to rug sweep, and I'm not done processing everything. We are doing date nights and eating meals together at the table to give us time to talk as a family. I need to work on making the gym a habit. I'm fighting a mild depression, is there such a thing as mild, and I think that will help. My therapist wants me to talk to my doc about meds, but I'd prefer to stay off them. I find that when I work out vigorously at least three times per week I feel pretty good, but I keep falling off that horse. I'll consider meds if I stop eating or getting up for work. As long as I'm functional I'll push through it. I think the focal question for me is to define what I want out of our relationship. Fidelity is a given, but I mean what do I want? I have a real hard time defining that. She has ended her affair. No contact with Om for a year now. She isn't going out without me anymore. Yet, I still feel hollow. I'm going through the motions and she is playing her part. We have our good times too. It's not all empty. But especially when I'm at work and just trying to go about my day I find it extremely depressing. I don't think the fact it feels empty is her issue. That's mine. I'm just not sure what to do about it right now. Big setback this week. She texted Joe, the friend from third grade she was trying to meet for lunch, not the cyber affair guy. She had been talking to one of her girlfriends D and she mentioned her baseball team was playing him that night. She texted him to wish him good luck. He responded thanks, then she mentioned she was still working on her marriage and that we should try to get both families together sometime. She didn't mention anything to me about it, but she didn't delete it. The text was about a week old when I saw it Tuesday. I was pissed. I confronted her about making contact again with him without discussing it with me. I had asked her not to contact him again until we had sorted things out. She claimed she thought things were going well, so they were sorted. She defended the text tooth and nail as nothing bad. We didn't talk much at all yesterday. I took youngest daughter to the doctor, her surgery is next week, for the pre-surgical clearance visit. We talked again this morning. She is still defending her actions. She agreed not to text him again and to show me any texts he sends to her. Nothing new on the VAR. I'm left to assume she doesn't mean any harm by her actions. She just doesn't understand the pain her betrayal caused and this guy's tie into that. She asked me point blank what my problem with him is. I told her that she was setting up a secret meeting with him for lunch, that's what my problem was. She said it wasn't secret, she just didn't tell me about it. What the hell? I think the underlying difference that is causing the tension is that she thinks it's okay for a guy and a girl to go have a meal together to catch up on things. In my opinion, that is a date and married people shouldn't be dating. She thinks I'm overreacting. She thinks I misunderstood her reasons for wanting to meet up with Joe. She knows I was hurt by the cyber affair discovery, but she thought that she had proven the Joe thing was innocent. I told her nothing was proven. We had put working through these things on hold, and they were on hold too long. Now that we are trying to work on them again, she just wants to get past it and not keep repeating the same ground over and over. I'd like to implement the 180, but I'm a little unsure of what change I'd be looking for out of her. I'd much rather reconcile, but we have a couple of value differences. Before D-Day I could handle those. Now, I don't think I can. 
She wants to be a social butterfly. She says I'm welcome to come along. However, between work, kids and the house I only want to go out once or twice a week. I can't join her for lunch unless she is willing to come out near where I work, which limits who else would be willing to join her. She wants to go hang at the bar after theater performances. They work the show from about 6 p.m. till 11 p.m., then go out for a drink or two and something to eat. To meet with them I'd have to leave the house at 10.30 p.m. I'm typically asleep by then and up at 6 a.m. I wouldn't say divorce is my goal, but I'm not seeing a middle ground that would reasonably make us both happy. She has been taking my lead the past couple of months, but she is starting to push boundaries again. She even said yesterday that she feels like she is in captivity. She is working a show right now, gone four nights a week and feels like she is in captivity. Really, spending three nights per week with me is equal to jail time. And we go out at least one of those three nights. Twice per month I go with her to cast parties with theater folks. I'd like to think I'm doing my part to stretch myself to be more social. But comments like that lead me to believe my wife is a bottomless pit that can never be filled. Let me clarify, she doesn't go out with them after the production anymore. She stopped doing that after D-Day from the cyber stuff. But she wants to start going out again. It was in the frame of this discussion the captivity comment came out. She said that during the production run there is no time to be social. That part of the theater is all business. She is missing going out after to socialize. I just don't think going out and hanging at the bar after 11 p.m. without me is a good idea. And me going out there to meet up with them that late is a little awkward. I have enough surveillance in place, overt and covert, that I'm comfortable she doesn't have her eyes out for anyone specific. I'm also comfortable, from conversations overheard on the VAR, that she is satisfied physically and not actively looking to have an affair. But she doesn't agree that hanging out at the bar with friends is bad for the marriage. I like your phrase divergence in our expectations about the marriage. I think it sums this specific problem up well. And I agree, it's not easily addressed. We just restarted MC, but due to schedules don't have another meeting for a couple of weeks. I'll be sure to make this a main topic. She is currently complying with my request that she doesn't hang out at the bar late without me. Sometimes that means I go out with them, but mostly that means she comes home. She has been making a great show of coming home all amped up and not being able to sleep. She will read or watch TV until 1 or 2 in the morning. She hasn't said it yet, but I'm sensing this will be fodder for defending her POV that she shouldn't need to come home right after the production. I can hear the argument now, well, you are going to just fall asleep anyway, why shouldn't I stay out a little? You know I'm not tired. Second session of MC last night. Our therapist always asks how things are going first. Wife said, pretty good. Therapist could tell by my look of shock I disagreed. I went through the events of the prior week, and shared that I think the core problem is we have different values when it comes to interactions with the opposite gender. After probing both of us, she confirmed my insight, which was both rewarding and worrisome. She called it a forever problem. She says most marriages have them. It existed in our marriage before the affair, but the affair broke the balance that existed. I kept my jealousy in check and gave her more freedom. I was more understanding that she was a naturally warm and affectionate person and was more tolerant of our differences. When the kids were young, she really couldn't do much with those freedoms that pushed me further than I was comfortable. Now that the kids are older, she is able to push the old norms further, and I'm not as at peace with it as I was prior to the affair. We ran out of time at that point, but it's clear the difficult part is going to be getting to a place where we are both comfortable. She feels my values and boundaries are stifling and cold. I think hers are naive and vulnerable. She said she made a mistake and now she feels she needs to pay for it for the rest of her life by changing who she is. I told her I think the same thing, other than I wouldn't call it pay for it. I call it preventing it from happening again. I'm glad she is being honest about her feelings going through the process. I hope we come discover some compromise that works for both of us. I can't go back to the old way. I can't live with the anxiety of it and my only hope for not having that is to emotionally detach from my wife. I never envisioned a marriage where I stopped caring about my wife. The choices don't seem very appealing. 1. Leave her. 2. Live with the anxiety and hope she never cheats again. 3. Emotionally detach and live as roommates. Obviously, I leave her if she cheats again. Does anyone see a fourth choice? Something in my control. I know there is an option where she conforms to my norms of not being so affectionate and friendly with other men. But she doesn't seem willing to do that, or if she does, she will be unhappy and feel controlled. Besides, I can't make her choose that. I can only control myself. So, I'm looking for another choice that's in my power. She started reading a book called Why Good People Do Bad Things. I think it's helping her to admit that what she did was very bad, but it doesn't in and of itself make her a bad person. It's a start anyway. She still has trouble discussing it with me. I think that makes it too real and more painful for her. Maybe getting her to this board will bring her around to the point where she starts to feel and experience that pain. I believe she needs to get to that point for us to heal. It was our 22nd wedding anniversary yesterday. She told me she loved me and hoped to have another 22 or more years ahead of us and try to make them better than the past 22. 
She admitted that she suspected I was considering leaving her, and that she hoped that she would be able to make the changes that would prevent that from happening. I confirmed to her that leaving her was very much on my mind, but it was in her power to keep that from happening, that I need her to be open, honest, faithful, and spend time with me. She says she is willing to do these things. She agreed to take June and July off from the theater. She will be busy there again in August and September, then should be off again until December and January, then done again until at least May of 2014. As there are not back-to-back -back productions in that schedule, it is much less of a time sink than the past couple years. If she sticks with that, I'll keep working with her. If she blows up, tells me I'm being controlling or starts working on the productions she said she was taking off, then we are done. I now have actions I can watch to see if she is sincere in making compromises. I feel like she is finally coming to grips with the fact that what she did was a betrayal. That her spending the past year buried in the theater did nothing to resolve anything, and worse, transferred a lot of my anger and feelings of betrayal onto the theater. Two months later, spending more time together has been helpful the last couple months. She has done a good job backing off from the theater. I work in marketing and have agreed to work with her on some of the marketing efforts at the theater. It's a couple day per month commitment, something we can do together and helps me get to know some of the folks there. I started taking an antidepressant about six weeks ago. It's also helped with my anxiety issues, which is helping me stay calm and deal with my triggers more rationally. We had a busy Friday and Saturday, so we planned to chill at home Sunday so I could putz in the garden. She isn't interested in manual labor, but I said it would be nice if she could just be outside with me. She likes to read, I suggested she could read a book. That idea resonated with her and all day Friday and said as she mentioned how she was looking forward to Sunday. After church I got changed and started in on the garden. She mentioned that today was the last day of a play two of her theater friends were in and if I would be upset if she went to see the play. I have to admit, just her asking really triggered me. But I'm proud of myself, I stayed calm and just said I was looking forward to spending time together today. I thought she was too, but that I wasn't her keeper and she should do whatever she though was best. I could tell that was not an answer she was expecting. The wheel was spinning for a while on that and I just grabbed my shovel and headed back to the garden. A few minutes later she showed up with a lawn chair and book in hand. The next eight weeks will be interesting. She works as a teacher, but for a state-funded program. The program's funds were hit by the sequester so she is limited in how many hours she can teach. She already hit her max for the summer term, so won't be working until the fall. It's only been a week and I can see how the extra time at home is affecting her. She started complaining about a couple of her friends went away for a weekend in Door County and they didn't invite her so she is feeling left out. That's a tricky area for me to converse with her about. I know it's related to her insecurity. That insecurity is also what led to her online affairs. I like that she is being open and sharing, but it also triggers me. Definitely something to discuss in MC. I've suggested she job hunt and make a list of projects around the house she wants to do. I can help her plan and do some of the heavy lifting in the evening so she can do whatever finishing work. Cleanup needs to be done during the day. She has made her list, most of its cleaning and things she can accomplish with little help from me. Hopefully she doesn't avoid working on her list. When she goes into avoidance mode, she gets engrossed in Facebook. That didn't turn out so well last time she was bored. No point in worrying too much about the what if, but I'm keeping my eyes open. Couple months later, still working my 12-step program, probably will the rest of my life. I'm able to spot my anxiety better and can deal with triggers in a more rational manner than just trying to avoid life. With the garden closed to the polar vortex, I'm developing some winter hobbies. The wife has stayed true to her word not to work back-to-back -back productions. I've gotten involved in the marketing committee at the theater. So, I'm getting to know some of the other members better which I think helps me feel a little more secure and that I know who she is hanging out with. They often meet nights that she has rehearsals, so we go to the theater and come home together, even if we are doing different things when we are there. She has cut out the flirting and hugging crap and as I've not seen or heard anything bothersome in a while I've all but stopped surveillance. I'll check once or twice a year moving forward just to be sure, but I don't anticipate finding anything, which is a big change in my attitude from a few months ago. We went through a patch prior to D-Day where we were not connecting much. That's gotten much better, we try to do something together every week that's just us time. No kids, no friends, just us. Could be playing a board game, dinner or a movie, but we have been decent about keeping to it. That has helped a bunch. I still sometimes feel like she says things out of habit and maybe isn't as sincere as she thinks she is. Part of that is me, I've never had tremendous self-image. Part of it she earned with her betrayal. It's difficult to untangle the issues. For example, when she says things like I'm so glad I married my best friend I have a hard time accepting it. The disconnect during the affair period didn't help. She would say things like I'm the most important thing in her life but then be gone every night. So, yeah, she earned that distrust as much as I come by it easily. I guess you could say we are reconnecting, but there is still some distance to go. Sometimes I still feel lonely even when I'm holding her in my arms. R takes a long, long, long time. 
She feels she put the marriage and the kids ahead of herself for the first 20 years of the marriage and she feels someone justified in looking out for number one and building friendships that she feels she has missed out on by all the moving around we have done. She acknowledges that the online affairs and being flirty and looking for physical attention was a mistake. She has stopped that, but feels that the theater is what she is good at and loves to do and doesn't want to give it up altogether. She has backed way off from the past two years, but she doesn't want to give it up altogether. She knows if I catch her even flirting with anyone at the theater, she would either have to give it up or divorce. If I catch her doing more than that choice would be divorce or divorce. Bad news. Wife deleted all her text messages sometime over the weekend without telling me first, per our agreement. I checked the activity on the account and there were around 100 texts over four days to a male theater friend. I'll try to recover the texts, but damn. Just damn. It's bad. I confronted her and she said she was just cleaning it up and I could look at it. I hooked it up and started application. She saw the message recovering deleted data and freaked out. She started quacking about how I should trust her and she wants her privacy. Then she said no and grabbed the phone and said I can't check it. I told her fine, I'll just assume she is a lying cheating W and she should get the F out of my house. She refuses to leave. This isn't going to end well. She went to the theater for the evening. I took the opportunity to move her stuff into the living room. She doesn't work tomorrow, I'm sure I'll come home to some vindictive crap. I should pack up the important stuff. I'm glad I gave R a try. If I had ended the marriage two years ago, I would have had regrets. Now I am 100% sure it's done and that I tried. I'm going to visit the lawyer first, then the bank then my pastor. I would like the house and custody for three years. Then she can have it. My youngest has three more years of HS I would like to see her through. If that doesn't pan out, I will probably rent a room from my 87-year-old grandma. Grandpa died a while back and she is living alone right now. Could be good for both of us. She is a damn good cook, and is only a 15 meters drive from the kids. She called today, wanted me to pack some clothes and arrange for the kids to come visit her on Mother's Day. I can do that. Her sister is going to take them over after church. I could tell she was hoping I would bring them, not going to happen. I will speak nice of her to the kids and give her free access to see them. Doesn't mean we are talking. Is she upset that I am ending our relationship? Yes, that I believe. But it is only because it tears down the image she has built with family and some friends. And it destroys the security and stability I bring. We have been together a long time. I feel bad for her and hope she gets the help she needs. But I need help too. For years my gut has been warning me and she has been feeding me a constant diet of crap. I can't pal it anymore. I need to get myself centered and I won't be able to do that if I allow myself to get sucked back into her drama. Time to apologize to my gut for not listening and believing her when she claimed I was the problem. I knew at the moment she took the phone away and said, I need some privacy. To add icing to the cake, my aunt called me and mentioned she saw my wife at a car show in her town, a couple towns away, and she was with some people that have a bad reputation in town. She said hello and my wife said hello back and smiled and waved. My aunt thought it was strange at the time but didn't think much of it. When she is ready to talk, I'll give her three choices. 1. She can detail out the truth, all of it. Move out of the house to her dad's and continue to get the help she needs. Then maybe in the future we can try dating again. That is not a promise of reconciliation, just the only condition in which it is possible. 2. She can keep her secrets, but still move in with her dad. I will treat her favorably in the divorce in exchange for letting me remain in the house with the kids until the youngest graduates HS. My lawyer has said I don't have much hope of that as an outcome from a judge. 3. She can fight me tooth and nail on all the above and take her chances in court where I have a good shot at limiting the amount of alimony because she has similar if not better earning potential than I do. If she is genuine, she should pick one, if not it's a crap shoot. Picking one doesn't mean she is genuine. Even if she picks one, I don't know that she could ever convince me I had the whole truth. Anyway, it unfolds it's going to be a tough couple of years. But at least I know it wasn't me. Could she still blame me? Sure, I fully expect her to. Would people eat her crap? Sure, she serves it up so nice it's hard to resist. I will pity them because I know how bitter the aftertaste is. I believe she has a dark side that remains hidden and she leads a dual life. She backed off after D-Day 1 but started to fall back into old behaviors recently. I don't think there is one boyfriend. I think she has a collection of buddies. Didn't know anything about a car show, probably thought she was at the theater. My guess is she would use the theater phone to arrange a meetup and leave her mobile at the theater so when I checked it, I would think she was there. About lawyer. I have had a phone consult and we meet face to face on Wednesday. If we try to prove adulatory as grounds for divorce, then we will do that. The burden of proof in my state is high, and fault doesn't affect division of assets or spousal maintenance. It only impacts the duration of the proceedings. With fault you can close in under six months, without you need to live separate for two years. The big thing is to get temporary division of assets in place, then we each become responsible for our own spending and any new debt. Her grandmother visited her yesterday. My STBXW asked her to apologize to me on her behalf. Without going into any detail, she admitted to her that she cheated and lied to me. 
My youngest visited her today and she told her that she hopes we can work out an agreement where we alternate weeks at the house. Not sure how that would work, but it at least shows she knows her recent antics were not effective. The crappy part, she will likely get the house, half my stuff, custodial care of the kids, child support and permanent spousal maintenance. Even if I prove infidelity, it doesn't matter when dividing marital property. And because I have always made more than her, I will be paying through the nose. And not because she can't support herself. No, it's because I pampered her and made her life easy. It's because I loved her and she played me for the chump I am. The truth is starting to come out. She confessed to two affairs. One of over two years with the guy I suspected, one with another guy I thought was a friend. Both married. I am devastated. Once I pull myself off the floor, I will be contacting their wives. She told me about the first. Then I asked if there were any others. She started to say no, then gave another name. I was too floored to think. Next I message we talk I am going to ask is that all of them. You have to ask the question the right way or it's technically not a lie. Well, in a cheater's world that is how it works. First guy was someone else. Second wasn't particularly close, but particularly offensive. We had him, his wife and kids over for dinner a couple weeks ago. So damn cold. I'll entertain revenge on the OM later. For now, I am going to protect my kids and my finances. If I can ruin their lives in the process, I won't feel bad about it. But let's face it, that is four men in three years, plus whatever I don't know yet. They may be sleaze, but it's obvious they are not the issue. Their wives know the truth, for now that will do. My son is in an upcoming production. I have requested that they ban this guy from the theater as a condition of my son's continued involvement with the production. Hopefully, it doesn't come to that, he is looking forward to performing. Even if they wind up denying my request, the board has to meet to discuss. That ought to make things very uncomfortable for him. Not everyone at the theater is a scumbag. Already have an appointment at Quest tomorrow for the full STD panel. I'll think on the DNA testing. Maybe later, for now the kids are dealing with a lot. I don't need to plant that seed in their minds. She admitted that two were physical and multiple times over at least the last two years. She was fuzzy on exactly when they started. I don't care what she has or doesn't have. Just reflecting back to her to keep her calm. We are getting a D. Hopefully in four hours I'll have a better idea how I will fare with custody give her recent antics. Right now, I can claim I don't want my kids to come home to see mom hanging on the back porch. This is a credible concern. That may not become the permanent arrangement, but it gives me room to breathe. In the short term I am focused on stability for the kids and protecting the money. She is going to get a chunk of that money no matter what I do or she does. I'm not going to make it any easier in this state than it already is for her to take me to the cleaners. I have enough drama in my life. I don't think I'm going to bother with them anymore. I know the wife got the message. I know she knows I'm sure. The danger is she trusts him. But even then, she has the seeds of doubt planted. If God wants him revealed for the pos, he is it will happen. I'm not feeling called to lead that charge. I did my part. Now turning energy and attention to lunch. Taking myself on a date to Thai food before the lawyer visit. The Mormon lives in NC now, so he is out of the picture. The other is the one who is still involved at the theater. My son knows what happened, but not with who. I figured better that he does not know than get pulled into the gossip at the theater. I've talked with the president, production manager and director. They all know what happened and with who. He agreed last night that OM will not be allowed in the theater when the cast is present. Aka, my son. After this week I would be surprised if he shows his face at all. I have two friends on the cast that know too. They will not let on they know unless OM is spotted. She was apparently discreet about it at the theater. My therapist loved the interaction I had exposing the OM said the way I handled it showed a lot of confidence. Something that I haven't had a lot of recently and that it was good to see. The biggest red flag was my gut. She was quite masterful at her deception. She made me doubt myself and was so firm in her assertion of innocence it had me feeling crazy. I even went on antidepressants at one point. She rarely called him from our phones. If she did, it was just to arrange work at the theater. She was in charge of props and he was the building super and stage a hand and key grip. So, the communication I monitored via text and VAR seemed legit. But leads to red flag number two, there was too much of it. She was communicating with him too much. Sure, it was about tables or building storage carts for props, but the sheer volume of interaction was odd. A couple of months, she texted him as much as she texted me. And I read them all, verified against the bill until the most recent event that led to discovery. We went to over 60 counseling sessions together post D-Day 1. I was very explicit in that I felt there was more to her story and that now was the time for truth. I warned her that if more came out after counseling and I found out that all these counseling sessions were all lie, we would be over. She still lied, even convinced the therapist. During my last visit, my therapist commented that this situation is rare. She said most active cheaters will avoid counseling or break into the not in love stuff. So, I guess that makes me special, but not unique. If I had to guess, she has some form of dissociative personality. It's really wicked. They didn't plan much. He would look at my wife's FB and she would post status messages like headed to the theater to work on props. 
where she would text him to see if the crew had moved the junk from the last build as it was blocking the fire doors. If he was available, he would just head over. If not, he would respond no, but I can get over tomorrow to work in it. They were discreet even with other theater people. I'm sure someone knew or suspected, but it certainly was not common knowledge. I even dropped by the theater unannounced a few times when she was going to be there alone to surprise her. But I think she would use the Find My iPhone app to keep tabs on me. So, in hindsight I should have gone Tom Clancy and her ass. I thought about it a couple times, but just figured I was losing my marbles. In the end, the gaslighting, deceit and disingenuous assertions of undying love hurt more than the affairs. And the affairs hurt more than anything I've ever felt in my life, and I've had a hard life. I'm feeling better now that my course is set on divorce than I have felt in many years. I know it's been said over and over again, trust your gut. If you suspect something, keep digging. Hopefully my story helps someone realize this point earlier than I did. Living with that self-doubt was destroying me. My son is taking it pretty hard. Hasn't talked to mom in a week. The girls have visited her at the hospital and had dinner with her last night. Son didn't go for dinner so I picked up subs and we bonded over switching cell phones around. STBXW wanted to get rid of the iPhone, so we swapped his number to it and got her a cheap flip phone. No point in letting a good phone go to waste. It may be a painful reminder to her, just a cool phone to him. She wiped the phone prior to committing herself, so no chance to back up or recover anything. When she called from the hospital, she said she didn't want a smartphone and I could throw her iPhone away. She asked for some type of phone as she did give out that cell number in her job searches, another possible lie. Her phone will not be a trigger, it's a phone. The phone was never the problem, she was. I'm not tossing out a good phone on the request of an irrational cheater. She got rid of it to prove to me she was done cheating, yeah, like tossing a phone proves Jack. But it could be she just realized that iPhone are that easy to recover from so she wants a dumb phone because then info once deleted stays that way. It would be nice to know who else is involved, but I'm fine without that. She can be someone else's problem. She is very attached to her stuff, but I think dividing will go easy. She will want the books, movies and various collectibles. There are a couple pieces of furniture that are family heirlooms from her side. I will want the camping and fishing gear. Gardening stuff stays with the house. If we fight over anything it will be cookware, and that is all highly replaceable. Then cleaning up and purging. Ran across a journal I had never seen. Like many of her journals there wasn't much written. But what I did find was alarming. She was a chaperone on a ski trip without church youth group in 2012. There was a youth from another group there that caught her eye. She had debated on how far she would have to go to get his positive attention and decided it was too risky at a Christian retreat. Who is this woman? This goes back further and is deeper and darker than I ever imagined it could be. Here is a transcript of that journal entry for those who want to try and analyze. January 13, 2012. So many years and yet the same issues apply now as they did then. I am currently at a ski weekend with the youth of our church. I am also reading a book this month about callings. I am in the process of refining what I would like to focus on in my studies because although I have narrowed things down quite substantially, refinement still needs to occur in many ways. Maybe because I am in my late 30s certain hormones drive my thoughts but there is something else driving these ideas in my head and I am not so sure they are from the dark side but things that need to come out. There is a youth here, not from our group, that I would call dangerously attractive. Why dangerous? Well, he is the type of person, purely on looks and first impressions, that I would almost throw myself at, if I were his age, and risk a lot for his positive attention. Judging by the girl he was hanging out with I would never really have a chance unless I'm willing to give out a lot. Although, it can't totally be overlooked that he is at a Christian retreat center. Sometimes I wonder if I would benefit going to therapy. I also tend to really overanalyze some things that read just very basic in principle. I guess that's why it's good that I have friends that I can just share with and they can help me put things in perspective. I just figure out what that kid has that drew my attention, it's the Wayne Campbell look going on. The things that seem the most attention grabbing are things that remind me of my early 20s. My styles may have changed a bit but my tastes in physical attraction have not. Wow, that was interesting to realize. I miss him a lot lately and it really kills me that I'm gone this weekend and next and then he's going to be gone for two weeks. I am really jealous of my time with him and I don't want to share time with him and I don't want to share it with anyone or anything, computers included. How can it be that we're in our late 30s already? We have an almost teenager and yet I still often feel that I'm not that far removed from our teen years. For those who may not know, Wayne Campbell is the lead character in Wayne's world. Basically, a goofy burnout type. That's her type and yes, that was me in my teens. If the parentage of the kid starts to bug me, then I'll do the DNA test. The oldest is no doubt mine. I know to the day when she was conceived and she has many traits from my family. The younger two take after her family. The probability is they are mine. If they are not, it doesn't really matter to me anymore emotionally or legally. The benefit to me is small from DNA testing and the harm to them is huge. They are already grappling with the fact mom cheated and has withdrawn from society due to embarrassment. I am the stable one they know will be there for them. 
I don't want them worried that I suspect they might not be mine. In a year or two when the dust settles, I'll get them checked. There is a DNA disorder that runs in my family. They will need to take a DNA test for that anyway, so I can just add to that. Crappy day today. Did some laundry and cleaned up the back porch, three season room. Kept running across some of her dirty clothes. The mind wanders off on certain items. Who did she wear them for? Not that it matters, it's just a painful reminder. I'm stuffing everything I find into her dresser and what doesn't fit into suitcases. The back porch is her homage to the theater. Props and scenery items from show past. I flipped through her photo album and in it was a picture of her and OM it was from a while ago at a theater party I didn't go to because I was out of town on business. So that Pia goes back at least to July, probably even earlier. I ripped the picture in half and deposited it in a box with some of her crap. There is so much in the house, so many reminders. It's going to be a long process to get it all packed away and cleaned up. I wish I can burn it all. My lawyer advised me to pack it all away nicely or she come after me for more money. Who knows? She took the youngest to the movies tonight. Picked her up before I got home. She took her laptop with her and is back to posting on FB. Changed her profile pic to a quote I may be afraid, but it's my turn to be brave and her cover pic to at least it's the first day of the rest of my life. Her status update is changes on the horizon, some good some not, life keeps on going either way. So, sounds like she snapped out of trying to R with me mode. I need to take a few days off work and have a mini meltdown of my own. My adrenaline has been pumping for two weeks now, I need to shut down for a while. Definitely seems to be shaping up for her to play the victim that this was a midlife crisis and I never gave her a chance. I know better, as do a few close family members and our pastor. But to the great majority of her people she can play that role. I suspect that is what she had planned all along. I can use it to my advantage. She either plays nice in the deep process or I expose far and wide the extent of her misdeeds. I have transcripts of her cyber sessions and copies of the letter from a while ago, asking her to come clean now or we would be over. Her sisters would have a field day with that information. My comment, hopefully OP sticks to his divorce and we will see the ending in part 4.